Uh, yeah, so the opening uh, opening discussion then, I want you to talk about these two questions. We'll go into uh, the breakout rooms to do it. So how important is belief in the bodily resurrection of Christ? And secondly, what difference would it make if Jesus' body was still in the tomb? Right? So how important is the belief in the bodily resurrection of Christ? Uh, what difference would it make if Jesus' body were still uh, in the tomb. So we'll, we'll divide into two groups for that. Right. So I think the general vibe in the, the, the group that I joined was that the resurrection is very, very important, right? So without it, without the resurrection, the whole of Christianity just falls apart. The whole thing, the gospel is a lie. There's, um, there's no hope past death. Um, there's no point uh, to be a Christian. It's just something a figment of your imagination and there's, 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 there's no reason to believe any of the other things as well. I think that's a, that's a good summary and that's really what we're going to see tonight. Um, the, the resurrection of Jesus is right at the heart of the gospel. Now, of course, in our gospel preaching, very often we, we fo focus almost entirely on the death of Christ to atone for our sins. And there's something obviously that's very right about that. I mean, uh, Paul says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 2 2, he was determined to preach nothing except Christ crucified. Right? Um, so the death of, Rose, of Jesus is, is obviously very, very important. If Jesus didn't die for our sins, if he didn't bear the wrath of God, then also we have no hope. You know, we've got no hope of being um, forgiven or being God's children or having eternal life or any of, any of those things. Um, but whilst the death of Jesus is very important, the resurrection is, actually, is, is, is of supreme importance to, to the gospel. In fact, if you have a look at the book of Acts uh, and the, pre the preaching of the apostles in the book of Acts, um, the resurrection dominates their sermons uh, in a way that the death of Christ doesn't. I mean, the death of Christ is normally there. Of course, the resurrection of Christ assumes the death of Christ. Um, but there's a very strong focus in the book of Acts on the resurrection of Jesus and the significance of it. Now, we see this also uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, which is a very familiar summary of the gospel that we have. Paul writes there, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Um, now, he's writing this because uh, the Corinthian church were actually, uh, it seems that they were rejecting belief um, in the bodily resurrection of the dead, not necessarily Jesus' resurrection from the dead, but um, the resurrection of believers. It seems that they didn't think that believers were going to have a bodily resurrection. So Paul wants to remind them of the gospel that he preached, the gospel they must hold fast to if they are going to be saved. And then he explains what it is um, in, the next, uh, in the next verse, which I haven't put on the screen. Just wait a sec. What happened there? So, and, uh, and then verse uh, three. See that okay for i delivered to you as of first importance what i also received that christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures that he appeared to Kephas, then to the 12 then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep so you see what he's emphasizing in this this gospel summary yes jesus died he was buried he was really dead he rescued us from our sins but he was risen he appeared to lots of people to the to the 11 he appeared to to paul and james and he, he appeared to 500 brothers at the same time he's emphasizing the gospel he preached was a gospel of the death and the resurrection um, of of Jesus Christ, and uh, uh, and he says that this this resurrection had happened according to the scriptures, and we'll come back to that a bit later. Um, 
So it's important not only that we affirm our belief in the resurrection of Jesus, but we're also going to need to understand what it means according to the scriptures. And that's going to be our, our focus tonight. And yet, uh, despite how important and central and foundational the resurrection of Jesus is, uh, it has been constantly under attack. Um, not only from outside the church, I mean, I guess you expect non-Christians to oppose the gospel, um, but it's also been under attack from inside um, the church as well. Now, I'm going to play a video uh, for us now, and this, uh, this video is from, uh, it's an Easter message uh, that is recorded by the Dean of Perth um, in Australia, right? So, uh, he's a leader, senior pastor of an a Anglican cathedral in Australia. And this is his Easter message that he's recorded. And, in, uh, and it's from 2008. Got a fair bit of publicity, and you'll see why in a moment. So we'll watch it, uh, what he says. It just goes for about three minutes. And then I would like to hear your reactions to it. What do you think? about what he is saying here in his, in his Easter message. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, can you see that? A lot of folders. <clears throat> can you see it? Nothing appearing yet. No. It's not folders, yeah. I shared the wrong screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now can you see it? Yes. St. George's. Yes. George's Cathedral, Perth. You can see that? Yes. All right. Yeah. Let's play. As Christians prepare to mark the death and resurrection of Christ this Easter, we need to challenge the belief that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was a physical resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus ought not to be seen in physical terms, but as a new spiritual reality. It's important for Christians to be set free from the idea that the resurrection was an extraordinary physical event, which restored to life Jesus' original earthly body. It would be wrong to demand an interpretation of the resurrection which includes the physical resuscitation of Jesus' body, when the accounts in the New Testament refer to the resurrection of a body transformed by the Spirit of God. Jesus' early followers felt his presence after his death as strongly as if it were a physical presence and incorporated this sense of a resurrection experience into their gospel accounts. But they're not historical records as we expect history to be written today. They're symbolic images of the breaking through of the resurrection experience into human lives. The early Christians wanted to convey their conviction that Jesus, despite the fact that he'd been put to death, overcame this death and all the constrictions of death that went with it, and now lived as a transformed spiritual reality to strengthen, inspire, and console. Their overriding concern was to communicate the reality of their experience of the new life which Jesus embodied. So it's not surprising that these accounts of Jesus' resurrection appearances differ with regard to place and time. Their authenticity doesn't depend on them being precise historical records. The disappearance of Jesus' body from the tomb, Jesus' appearance behind locked doors and his vanishing from sight, his appearance as a gardener, inviting Thomas to place his hand into his pierced side, the recognition of Jesus by disciples at Emmaus during a meal, these are all images of the triumph of the Spirit of God over all that physically thwarts and damages us in this life. St. Paul's teaching is very clear. Our earthly bodies will be transformed so that they'll be like Christ's glorious body. What is sown in natural body is raised a spiritual body. So the empty tomb is not the assurance that our bodies will be miraculously reassembled, thank goodness nor is it the hope of an extension of life for a few believers which would demean the graciousness and generosity of God. It's the image of a complete transformation of life available to all. However, if some find it helpful to attach a physical dimension to the image of the resurrection, so be it. 
it would be wrong to place limits on the extent to which the New Testament images can be helpful. But faith in the resurrection of Jesus need not require us to believe in the physical resuscitation of Jesus' earthly body. People who find that concept difficult are by no means excluded from the Christian faith and the celebration of Easter. I'm John Shepherd, Dean of St George's Cathedral, Perth, Western Australia. May you have a very happy and joyous Easter. Okay, now I'm interested to hear what is your reactions as you listen to that. So, uh, are you happy to, to share what, what, was, uh, what were some of the things that you noticed there? What was he saying and what did you think about it? And he, he mentions a new sense of the resurrection. So although there have been uh, renewed attacks um, on the gospel, on the resurrection in our day, um, actually those kind of uh, attacks of the resurrection have been happening from the beginning. And we see Paul responding to the denial of bodily resurrection in the Corinthian church in, in, in this letter. We've already read the start of chapter 15. But now he continues on in verse 12. He says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as uh, raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also uh, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. They're very strong words, aren't they? Um, he's saying, look, if Jesus is dead in the tomb, and you can go and if you can go and find his bones somewhere, then it's useless preaching the gospel to people because what does it do anyway? Um, actually, uh, you're preaching lies because the heart of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus. So if you're preaching that, then that he's preaching that and he's dead in the tomb, then you're, you're a liar and you're misrepresenting what God is like. Um, your sins are not forgiven um, because uh, Jesus had to be raised for that to happen too. Um, there's no hope for the future. There's no hope past death. If Jesus is not raised, then there's no such thing as eternal life. There's no hope past the grave. So... You know, what's the point in suffering as a Christian and giving up things for others if you're just living for this world? Doesn't make doesn't make sense. We're to be pitied or felt sorry for above all people. We're pathetic. We're the most pathetic people in the world. Um, the alternative, which you see later in the passage, is we may as well eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Um, I saw I saw a sign like that uh, at one of the restaurants here in Penang. It says, "Eat, drink." Uh, rest, repeat. <laughs> and it's a good summary of what a non-Christian world does, isn't it? It's eat, eat, drink, rest, repeat. That's it. Nothing else to live for. Um, and if we've got no resurrection, we've got nothing to live for either. Right? In other words, denying the resurrection of Christ is tantamount to denying the Christian faith. If if Jesus is not bodily raised, and therefore believers being bodily raised, um, the entire gospel collapses. We may as well quit this class um, and, and go to the pub or something like that, because there's no, there's no point in being a Christian um, if, if this is all not, not true. Um, so if you understand that, then what, what flows from that is that uh, belief in the bodily resurrection is necessary for salvation. Right? affirming the resurrection of Christ is necessary for 
for salvation. And so that dean, whoever he is, is not going to heaven. He's, he doesn't believe the gospel. If you don't hold fast to the gospel, you can't be saved. Paul writes in Romans, 4, Romans chapter 4, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. It's talking about Abraham. Um, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. It's a striking phrase, isn't it? Jesus was raised for our justification, which implies if he wasn't raised from the dead, you can't be justified. You can't be declared right with God. You can't, you can't be saved, in other words. He must be not only died, but resurrected if you're to be reconciled to God. Um, see a similar thing in chapter 10. Uh, he says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see the condition for being saved? You must acknowledge Jesus as Lord and believe that he's been raised from the dead. You can't be saved apart from believing in the resurrection. Um, so if we had, you know, we, that we had time to go through the New Testament in detail, um, we would find hundreds, literally hundreds of references to the resurrection in nearly every chapter. Um, of the New Testament. It's very, very important. Um, N.T. Wright is generally not one of the great, uh, I mean, he's a prolific writer, but uh, if you've heard of him before, he's most famous for his new perspective on Paul, which is uh, not a good teaching. Uh, it's a wrong teaching. It's a denial of justification by faith alone. So um, be careful when you're reading things from N.T. Wright. This is just a disclaimer, but um, he's probably right on this particular point. Right? The question of Jesus' resurrection lies at the heart of the Christian faith. There is no form of early Christianity known to us, though there are some that have been invented by ingenious scholars, that does not affirm at its heart that after Jesus' shameful death, God raised him to life again. Already by the time of Paul, our earliest written witness, the resurrection of Jesus is not just a single detached article of faith. It's woven into the very structure of Christian life and thought, informing, among other things, baptism, justification, ethics, and a future hope, both for humans and the cosmos. In other words, the resurrection is very important. Okay, let me pause there. Any questions that you would like to ask? All right, uh, we'll keep going then. Uh, so the next thing we'll have a look at then is, well, what, what actually happened um, when Jesus was, was raised uh, from the dead? Uh, so you can, see a, a, you can see a summary, I think, in the notes. Um, these are some of the things that, uh, that happened when Jesus was, was raised. So firstly, um, the first thing we see is that he really was dead. Like he really was dead. It was verified, um, even by the authorities themselves, that Jesus died. So let's look at a few of these. Luke 23, 44. All right. So can I get someone to read this? Hey, I'll read. 44 to 49. It was now about a six hour. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, before the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in through, sorry, in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had been assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
Great, thank you. And then we'll read John. We'll just have a skim through. Maybe we won't read the whole thing. But you can see the other things that happen that John, John records, right? Uh, the soldiers, uh, they want to take, they don't want the bodies there on the Sabbath, so they want to make sure they die, right? So uh, the Jews ask Pilate that their legs will be broken so that they'll die faster. But when they come to Jesus, he was already dead. But just to make sure, uh, they put a, a spear, you know, going through his side, probably all the way up through his lungs and heart, right? Um, and out comes blood and water, which is a, which, which shows that he's already, it's a medical thing, shows that he's already dead. Um, so I, that's the first thing. If you, if you want to establish that Jesus was, bodily resurrected, then the first thing you've got to establish is that he really died, right? Um, and uh, who was there witnessing as Jesus died? All of people the centurion. The centurion. John, Mary. Yeah. Right, so there's soldiers, a there's a grand crowd, his disciples is there. And even his enemies, right, like the Jews, they're all the ones that want him dead are watching on, right, to make sure that he's dead, right? <laughs> um, I remember for the Roman soldiers, right, if, I mean, if an execution didn't go according to plan, they would be killed themselves, right? So um, they're not going to make any mistakes about this, right? They are professionals, they're killing people. Right? So that's the first point, uh, is that he had to die. Right? So the next thing that has that uh, happens is that he's buried mm. um, in the tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Right? Mm. So let's pick up from up John's gospel this time. John 19, 38 to 42. If you'd like to read. Mm. After these things, yeah. Thank you. yeah. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with the spices, as it is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was closed at hand, they laid Jesus there. Thanks for reading that. Um, so you can see the emphasis there again and again. It's, it's body, 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 body. He has to ask Pilate um, that he can um, for permission to take the body. If we were to go across to, um, to Mark's gospel here, um, Pilate himself is surprised that he's dead, right? Uh, he's, he summons the centurion to ask whether he's already dead. And then the centurion says, yes, he's already dead. And then he grants, notice the word here, the corpse. Uh, to, to, to Joseph. So um, all the Gospels mention Joseph of Arimathea by name and that he was buried, that Jesus was buried in a new tomb that belonged um, to him. So the next thing that we see is that uh, the tomb was sealed and Roman soldiers guarded it. Now, only the Gospel of Matthew tells us about uh, the soldiers, right? So Matthew 27, verse 62. Who'd like to read this? The All next. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, 62 only, right? 62 to 66. Uh, all right. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how the imposter said, 
while he was still alive. After three days, I will raise. Therefore, order the doom to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last four will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldier. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the doom secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Mm. Right. So we'll come back to this in a moment when we look at some of the alternatives that are put forward, right? But Jesus' opponents are worried that uh, they know Jesus said he would be raised from the dead. They're worried that the disciples are going to fake it by stealing the body. And so they get this, uh, they seal the tomb, they put guards there to make it secure, um, and, and, and so on, right? Um, so in other words, it's not going to be easy to steal the body, right? <laughs> Um, next one, uh, some, woman, some women and possibly the guard witnessed the burial. So this is Luke 23 and verse 55. Uh, who'd like to read? Twenty-three fifty-five. All right, how about we have you and read for us? Is that okay? Yeah. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they were selected. Right, so they followed, they saw the tomb, right? They know which one. And I guess it's probably not hard to miss because, I mean, hard to miss because, uh, you know, there's a soldiers there and all of that, right? Okay, uh, so he's, at this point, he's really dead. He's buried in the tomb. They know which tomb. His body can't be stolen from the tomb because it's guarded. Right? Um, and then the testimony of all the gospels then is that uh, he is he is resurrected. The, the tomb was the tomb was empty. Uh, we can look at Luke twenty four here. We might not read all of this one, right? But they go. The women are going to the tomb, uh, and they find that the stone is rolled away um, and there's an angel there saying, he's not here, he's, he's risen. They go in and they find that the living cloths are, you know, are, are there by themselves. The tomb is empty. Uh, in John 20, we see something, uh, something similar. Uh, but we, we, what's added here is that the faith cloth that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the other linen cloths, but it was folded up in a place by itself. Now, if you were trying to steal a body, <laughs> would you bother to, you know, fold it nicely on your way out? You're not going to, you're not going to do that, and so on. It's as if his, you know, his body is just, you know, vanished through the thing, and then he is, uh, and, and someone has folded it. Yeah. So the tomb is empty, um, and then of course we have all the resurrection appearances that um, that come up. That we've already read one Corinthians fifteen. We appeared to. Um, you know, to the 12, to 500 at one time and all that, right? Many of whom were still alive, right? So that you could still you go and talk to them and say, did you really see him alive or not? Was it just, were you just making it up? Um, and Luke 24 got quite a number of resurrection appearances here. Jesus appears to the two on the road to Emmaus. Uh, he appears before the uh, 11 disciples. Um, he says, touch me. Uh, and and touch me and see that I'm not a ghost. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I, I have. He eats in front of them. If you've watched Ghostbusters before, you know that ghosts can't eat food. You know, and they say that uh, ghosts don't leave teeth marks, right? <laughs> um, he's really alive um, bodily to be able for them to touch him. Of course, in John's Gospel, Thomas says, I won't believe unless I have to put my finger in. In, in the hands and the side, um, and so on. Uh, and then at the end, uh, after 40 days, he ascends, he ascends to heaven. So that in Luke, so that also in, in Acts. So that's kind of the, the, the data, I guess, in, in brief here. Um, he's really dead, he's buried. Um, they know the right tomb, the tomb is empty, and um, 
they, he appears to people over 40 days and then he ascends back to, um, to heaven. So uh, let's come back to the, the introduction then. We, were to, we watched that video just now from the, the Dean of Perth. And uh, we've seen that sometimes people want to deny physical re resurrection in order to favor a, a, a spiritual resurrection. So you know, I don't know if you heard this song before, right? He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus is today. He walks with me and talks with me along that narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. Great song so far, isn't it? <laughs> So you get to that last line. Uh, he lives within my heart. Now, of course, Jesus does live within our hearts. It's, uh, there are orthodox ways of reading this song. I don't think this song is denying the physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But it does sound like that, isn't it? Saying, look, he's not risen. It's not that he's you know, actually risen from the dead. He's just, he's, he's risen in my heart. It's a kind of psychological um, thing. And that's the kind of thing that uh, certainly that uh, Dean in Perth was arguing and others. Here's another example um, from a guy called Marcus Borg. The Irrelevancy of the Empty Tomb is the name of his book. Resurrection does not refer to the resumption of protoplasmic or corpuscular existence. To be sure, resurrection could involve something happening to a corpse, namely the transformation of a corpse, but it need not. Thus, as a Christian, I'm very comfortable not knowing whether the tomb was empty. Indeed, the discovery of Jesus' skeletal remains would not be a problem. It doesn't matter because Easter is about resurrection, not resuscitation. Now, I wonder if you agree with that. <laughs> They were the soldiers. Um, yeah, the end of Matthew's gospel in Matthew 28 says that they, when they saw the angel, they got scared, they ran away, and then uh, they were paid by the Pharisees to say that the disciples stole the body. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Yeah. So what do you think about that quote from Marcus Paul? You know, uh, I'm trying to understand the difference between resuscitation and resurrection. Both are physical, isn't it? But resuscitation... Not in their minds. Uh, resuscitation seems to think that he didn't actually die. Like he almost died, but didn't die. No, they're saying re they, they say resuscitation is an is a actual bodily resurrection. So he actually died. Resurrection for them is something that can happen in someone's heart, you know? Um, oh, I see. The psychological thing. It doesn't have to be an actual thing. Okay. But, okay, maybe for if one person claims that it could be, it could be a psychological reaction, but when 12 of them see that, when 500 people see that, and none of them can really deny it. Cannot be saying that 500 people are having this kind of reaction at the same time, right? So, doesn't make sense. Right. So this is, this is how William Lane Craig responds, not necessarily to Michael Paul, Marcus Paul, but in general. Um, this is what he says. He's an apologist, William Lane Craig. We've heard of him before. We need to see clearly that there can be pos uh, that there can be positive theological impl implications of the resurrection only insofar as its historical reality is affirmed. While many theologians may find such a conviction hopelessly antiquated, the man in the street knows better. His common sense tells him that there's no reason why a dead man should be decisive for his existence today, and I agree with him. Once doctrinal teachings are detached from their historical realities, we have entered the arena of myth. And there is simply no good reason to prefer Christian myths over other myths. 
or for that matter, secular philosophies. The resurrection is only real for our lives today if it is a real event of history and he's absolutely right. You can't spiritualize the resurrection and destroy the historical core. It does have spiritual significance and theological meaning, but that theological meaning only makes sense if it, the historical events really happened, you see. Right? Um, so we, if Jesus' bones is still in the tomb, it does matter. It's not an irrelevance if the tomb was not empty. If the tomb's not empty, we should quit this course and quit being Christians, and I should get a new job, you know, because we shouldn't be, because Christianity is a lie. May as well pick any other philosophy that we want, because anyway, it's not true anyway. Um, so let's, let's go on and uh, look at some of the alternative explanations. I'm sure you've heard some of these um, uh, before. Um, uh, we'll come back to this later. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the alternative explanations then? Uh, I'll share my lecture notes instead for this part. I don't have any slides. Okay. Do you see that? So these are the, these are the common ones. Um, Christopher Hitchens, you know, the famous atheist, he says, we are finally entitled to say that we have a right, if not an obligation, to respect ourselves enough to disbelieve the resurrection. You can see as an atheist, he wants to deny the resurrection of Jesus. So these are some of the common objections that people have. Number one, the disciples stole the body and then spread news about Jesus' resurrection falsely. Um, and that one is, is, is drawn from, uh, from the Gospels itself. Well, we already saw that that's what the Pharisees were, uh, were worried about. And, and, and that's why uh, um, they put the guards at the tomb so it, so it couldn't happen. But in the end, Jesus was resurrected anyway. And so we read in Matthew 28, while they were going, behold, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they'd assembled, with the elders and taking counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So... This one here, you know, this one's actually in the Bible itself. You know, the, Jesus' opponents to try and squash the resurrection, they bribed the soldiers and did some other corrupt stuff behind the scenes to say that the whole thing was a, um, was, was a, was a hoax. Um, so there's a lot of things that doesn't add up with this. We've already talked about the, you know, the linen, uh, linen cloth was folded. So if you're still in the body, why would you do that? Why would the disciples do this anyway? I mean, they were weak and discouraged. They ran away. Um, Peter denied Jesus. They were scared. Um, there's guards at the tomb. How, how are they going to do it anyway? And even if they did manage to do it, remember the apostles go on to preach this for the rest of their lives, and most of them are martyred as a result of it. So how can you go on living a lie for decades upon decades, suffering for, for something that you know is a lie. I mean, people will die for something that they think is true. I mean, like we have uh, suicide bombers and these kind of things. Um, but you won't die for something that you know is a lie, that you know is false. People just don't do that. Right? So the second one, uh, this is very common, uh, that, that people would hold this one. Jesus was never buried. The burial account is legendary. So how do you get, you know, how do you disprove the empty tomb? You just assert that he was never buried there in the first place. That's why the tomb was empty, because he was never put there. Um, so now the strength of this argument is that it was common practice for crucified criminals to be um, you, you know, just taken down from the cross, thrown, you know, thrown in a pile to be fed on by the birds and the dogs. That's usually what happened to crucified people. So they're saying that that's what happened to Jesus too. Um, except all of the Gospels mention 
Joseph of Arimathea, um, suggesting it, it, its his historical authenticity. I mean, that Joseph is not a nobody. He was a, someone who was well known, could have been easily disproved, you know, if, if this wasn't true. Um, and any, in any case, Jesus was no ordinary person, was he? There was great crowds watching on as he was crucified, including his disciples. His own mother was there, his, um, uh, his friends, the women. Wouldn't it be more unlikely? Wouldn't it, surely it's more likely that they would see to it that he had an honorary burial than that they left his body to be thrown to the dogs and the birds. Right? I mean, which one is really more likely given the special circumstances of how Jesus uh, died. Right? So I, what, what you see with many of these alternatives is you actually need a lot more faith to believe these alternatives than to believe the, the accounts of the New Testament. So the next one, the swoon theory, uh, this one is that Jesus only fainted on the cross, so he wasn't really dead. And then he revived later in the cool of the tomb. Now, this one is just, uh, is, again, very hard to sustain. Um, remember, Jesus is brutally tortured by professional soldiers while his enemies are watching on. The night before he hasn't slept because he's been praying through the night. Before his crucifixion, he's been tortured. You know, he's been whipped and, 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 and so on. He's so weak that he can't even carry his own cross. That, that's why um, someone needs to help him to carry his cross to where he's crucified. Um, so, uh, and, and we've already seen that Pilate checks that he's dead. The centurion confirms that he's dead. Everyone else is watching on. He's got a spear that's put through his side to make sure that he's dead and, 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 and so on. Let's say that he could survive all of that somehow, right? Um, and he's buried in the tomb. How is he going to push the stone back? How is he going to get rid of all the guards that are posted at the tomb? And then the next day or whatever, walk, you know, walk quite a long distance on the road to Emmaus and so on. I mean, if he can't even carry his cross, how can he single-handedly move the stone from the tomb? It just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense at any level, um, uh, this theory. But, you know, people have argued it, you know, over the years. The women went to the wrong tomb. You know, people like to argue that one too. But, you know, why didn't someone, for example, some of the men, maybe the male disciples or the Pharisees, most of them were men, why didn't they just say, oh, there's the tomb? And by, by the way, here's the body. Um, why wouldn't they just produce the body? If they went to the wrong tomb and the body was still in the tomb, just produce the body. Um, obviously, they didn't do that because they didn't have the body. Um, so uh, that one's not very, you know, not very logical argument either. Jesus was never actually crucified. It was someone else. This is the argument of the Quran. Uh, and... Again, this one's quite inconceivable, really. I mean, it, it's a public execution. His opponents is watching on. He's a high-profile figure. Surely they would know whether they were killing the right person. Um, the resurrection is, is an allegory, not a fact. Right? So um, we've, we've talked about that at some length already, but there's nothing in the in the biblical narratives that suggest that it's an allegory. It's written as a historical account. Uh, and then the hallucination thing, this was very popular, John Shelby Spong, who was again another Anglican bishop in the United States, uh, didn't believe in the resurrection. Guess what? Under the time when he was bishop over 30 or 40 years, baptisms in his diocese decreased by about 70% or something like that. I wonder why. Um, uh, but how could it be a hallucination? Because a, a, a hallucination is something that you that you, you have in private. It's not a public thing. But, you know, you can't have you can't catch a hallucination. You might be able to catch COVID from someone, but you can't catch a hallucination from someone else. And we read in one Corinthians that five hundred people saw Jesus at the same time. Five hundred people can't have the same hallucination 
at the same time. It just it it just doesn't it just doesn't work like that. Um, so again, it just it's just an argument that just doesn't really make any sense. Um, it requires a lot more. You really have to close your eyes to the evidence in order to believe an argument like that. And then the last one, spiritual resurrection or divine vision, walking faith um, in, in the disciples. And so we've seen in the accounts that Jesus actually goes to some lengths to show that he's really alive, um, that they can touch him and watch him eat things um, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, and again, well, what happened to the body? That's always a question to us. So those are the, you know, those are the alternatives and they really just don't make any sense. Um, there's one last argument that we can make here and that is where there's smoke, there's fire. Right? So it's absolutely clear that something remarkable happened that led to the gospel spreading throughout the ancient world um, at a rapid rate. Um, something remarkable must have happened in order to trigger the spread of the gospel through the Roman world. Something like a resurrection from the dead. So if you see smoke, then there must have been a fire. You know, if you see this rapid expansion of the gospel by people who claimed that Jesus was alive again, then surely there must be some basis to it. Yeah. So I'll pause there. Uh, any, any thoughts about that? So let's uh, think about the meaning of the resurrection then as we come towards the end. And I mentioned at the start, 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus is raised according to uh, the scriptures, which implies if we want to understand what the resurrection is about, then we need to go back to the Old Testament. Right? Um, and uh, we see in the Old Testament that there is a, uh, a general belief concerning life beyond um, death. Uh, we see that, for example, Genesis 25, Psalm 49, and so on. Um, occasionally, bodily resurrection is kind of in, envisaged. So um, Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 19 says, says this. Uh, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and, and sing for joy. Um, there's a corporate dimension to the Old Testament uh, resurrection call, right? So um, there's, a, there's a view that this is going to happen to everyone at the end. The key passage here is Daniel chapter 12, uh, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt, right? So there's a view at the end of the world People are going to be raised from the dead and it will be judgment day. That's a key point, really. The day of resurrection is the judgment day. You know? And it happens to everyone. You know? And this is the belief during Jesus' time. So uh, John chapter 11, when Jesus is with Martha, um, Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And she says, oh, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Everyone gets raised again at the end. Right? Um, but Jesus makes this slightly surprising response, right? I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. He says, I am the source of resurrection life. I am the I'm the judgment day, and I'm the one who can give that resurrection life of the end. It's a staggering claim. Uh, and, of course, there's various points in the Old Testament, especially Psalm 16, which is picked up in Peter's Pentecost sermon, um, that talks about um, the resurrection of the Messiah. David's writing the psalm. He says, my heart is glad, my whole body being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure for you will not abandon my soul to shield or let your Holy One see corruption. Peter says in the Pentecost sermon, well, clearly David's not talking about himself because he's dead and still in his tomb. Um, it must be talking about or um, anticipating the resurrection of, of Jesus. Yeah. All right, so uh, we have Jesus' own teaching about the resurrection. And uh, firstly, Jesus says that this is uh, happens according to uh, God's uh, God's plan, uh, and so Luke nine twenty two, 
is a, is a, would be an example of that. Um, we have three uh, raisings during Jesus' earthly ministry that anticipate his own resurrection, um, and including Lazarus. And we see it's at the, the heart of the apostles' uh, testimony to Jesus. So uh, Luke 24, verse 46 to 47. Luke 24. So Jesus appears and he says, um, you know, opens their minds to understand the scripture. He says, all the scriptures is fulfilled in me. And then their job is to be his witnesses. You are witnesses of these things. They are to proclaim that Jesus has died and risen, that there's repentance, for, uh, that there's, uh, people should repent for the forgiveness of sins, and they are to be the witnesses of his, his resurrection. We see that again in the book of Acts. It says, uh, you will be my witnesses, and then they choose the 12th apostle, Matthias, um, and his job is to become with us a witness to, to the res resurrection. And this, of course, is why you can't have modern-day apostles, by the way, because the job of an apostle is to witness to the resurrection of Jesus. So you can't be an apostle 2,000 years after, <laughs> afterwards. It's impossible. Right, so that's the Old Testament. That's Jesus' teaching. Now, um, the new, uh, the, what, what's it all about? What's the meaning of it? Uh, firstly, it means that the new age has dawned um, uh, the, the, the last the last days so you, I guess you were looking at uh, last week at the Old Testament hope of a messianic age that would come when the Messiah would arrive God's spirit would be poured out that um, and that there would be resurrection and, and, and there would be the judgment day and, and all of those things that you read in, in, in the Old Testament hope and this is what Peter proclaims. At, at Pentecost. He says, what's the resurrection of Jesus all about? And the pouring out of the Spirit, it means that the last days have, have arrived. Right? He says, uh, because in the last days, that's when God is going to pour out his, his Spirit, and that's what's happened. Um, they killed Jesus. God raised him from the dead. God has made him Lord and Christ, and then he has poured out the resurrected Jesus has poured out his Holy Spirit on his people um, to usher in uh, the last days. And so you probably remember this, this uh, diagram from maybe from Bible overview all those days back, right? We have creation, fall, Jesus, and then new creation. Right, and, and, and there was the prophecy that they would have the, the new age that would come. And we're, we're, you read the Old Testament, it's, it sounds like, okay, whenever the Messiah comes, then uh, it, it all comes in one package. But we find out that it begins with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus dies, he's raised, and the kingdom of God begins. And we have this overlap of the ages here, such that we now live in this period called the last days in this overlap um, between the present age and, and, and the age to come. Because the, the new age uh, would be the day when, um, you know, when, when resurrection happened, when the spirit was poured out, when the kingdom of God arrived, um, when sin was judged, etc. And all of those things happen at the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, it hasn't been fully consummated um, it's a it's a now but not yet kind of uh, uh, reality uh, I mean Jesus is raised but he's not it's still not the time when every knee bows and every every tongue confesses and so on um, and yes we have God's spirit but we're not in God's God's uh, physical uh, presence and yes, we're forgiven of our sins, but we're still struggling with sins. Yes, we've been resurrected spiritually, but we haven't been resurrected um, physically yet and so on. So it's now, but it's not, uh, not yet. Uh, but the resurrection of Jesus means that that new age has already dawned. That's the first, first point here. Uh, second point. Uh, 
it means that Jesus is the king of that new age okay? uh, because he's been raised again as, as king. Right? And remember the Old Testament uh, promised that one of David's descendants would rule over his kingdom forever, 2 Samuel 7, for example. And that's the point of uh, Peter's Pentecost sermon. This Jesus that is now Lord and Christ. In, in other words, he's been raised again as God's eternal king who would rule forever. So resurrection means that the new age of God's kingdom has dawned. It means that Jesus is the king of it because how do you know Jesus is God's eternal ruler who will rule over all nations forever? Well, he conquered death. That's why he can rule forever, because he conquered death. So that's the second point. Uh, the third point, uh, it's God's positive verdict on Christ and his sacrifice. You see, if Jesus stayed dead in the tomb, what would we conclude? We would have to conclude that his death was, for, as it was a punishment for his own sins. Because death is a punishment for sin. We, we, we couldn't think he died for our sins because he stayed dead. Right? So the fact that he is raised from the dead is a vindication of his sacrifice. Right? It shows that his sacrifice was, in fact, successful. Um, and we see, uh, we see this kind of thing a, a few times, especially we see it in Isaiah 53, um, where you know we have the, the death of Jesus, or uh, where he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and so on. But verses ten to twelve look forward to his his uh, resurrection and his vindication. Um, it says, "Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore." I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death. Do you see the point there? Why is Jesus resurrected or vindicated? Because his sacrifice was not for his own sins, but it was for ours. Similar thing we see in Philippians 2. Uh, you know, this glorious hymn of Jesus humbling himself, being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name. See, the resurrection of Jesus is his vindication, the vindication of his death. Um, it's his positive verdict. Um, so that's the third uh, point. The fourth point we see here is that it shows that sin, death, and judgment are fully and finally dealt with because punishment for sin is death right? death is fully paid for and then death is conquered at the cross and, and that's how that glorious chapter of 1 corinthians 15 which we've looked at a bit tonight ends of course the sting of death is sin the power of sin is the law thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain, right? Death is not victorious, ultimately. Death is powerless. Jesus wins. He defeats sin. He defeats death um, as he is raised victorious. Okay, fifth point. It guarantees that we too will be raised as well. And again, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 makes that point. We'll go to verse 20. It talks about Jesus' death as the first fruits. Um, there's a member in my church who, uh, for some reason, I, I think he's following some law from the Old Testament that doesn't apply to Christians. But uh, anyway, what he, he believes in first fruits. So he has a fruit tree in his back garden and he believes that the first fruit needs to be given to a pastor in the church <laughs> so his uh, fruit tree gave fruit and guess what he gave me the first 
the first fruits. I said, why didn't you give it to the bishop? You know, <laughs> said I gave it in last year. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the point of the first fruits, though, if there's one fruit, that means that there's going to be more, right? And so if Jesus is raised, it means that we also are going to be raised. It's the first uh, of, of many. That's how first fruits works. Okay, so it, it's the guarantee of our own resurrection. And, and, and Peter puts that so beautifully in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we have a living hope for the future. Right? We, have a, we look forward to an inheritance in heaven that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Right? And that hope is based upon the sure foundation of the resurrection of Jesus, because he died uh, and rose, we can be sure that when we die, we also will one day uh, rise again too. And so this becomes the grounds, this is the last point, I think, this becomes the grounds, uh, oh, sorry, one more point here, uh, it affirms the importance of our bodies, right? So if, uh, if, we have bodies now, we're going to have bodies in the future, then it matters what you do with your body because there's continuity between your body now and your body in the future. Right? So it's an encouragement to fight sin. I think probably the Corinthians were thinking, doesn't matter what you do with your body because anyway, after you die, you'll get rid of it and you, have, and you just have your spirit in heaven. So who cares what I do with my body? I can just live in sexual immorality or whatever. No, resurrection means it matters what we do with our bodies. Yeah. And the last point, uh, it's the ground of our evangelistic mission. Right? If Jesus has been raised as Lord, uh, he's returning as a judge one day, and every knee will bow, every tongue confess before him, then uh, we need to tell people to respond to Jesus now right? um, because if they don't they will face him as the judge at the end we can either accept him as our savior now or face him as our judge at, at, at the end um, and so because he's raised and he's raised over all nations we therefore go and make disciples of all nations and that's the point of course that jesus makes in the great commission in matthew 28 it says there all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I've been raised as Lord. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. It's not one God for one nation, one God for another nation. Jesus is Lord of all. Therefore, we go to all. And we say, repent, believe in Jesus as your King and Savior. So that, you know, there's a, there's a very kind of brief run through it took me more than five minutes sorry about that but uh that's the meaning of the resurrection and if you want to go in more detail you can you can look through your 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 textbook um or you can read through the lecture notes and and you can go in more detail uh, on that i'm going to lead us in prayer and then uh we can stay back for any more questions like discussing how old we will be when we're <laughs> when we're resurrected and all that <laughs> uh i'll pray first yeah Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is truly and bodily raised from the dead. Thank you, Lord, that we can know for certain this life is not all there is. There is eternity to come, and we can face death with confidence because we know that Jesus has already dealt with our sins, and we look forward to glorious resurrection bodies in your eternal kingdom. Lord, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful hope. We live in a world that is so full of so much decay and suffering. We've, uh, we've gone through so much with COVID. Lord, thank you that there is a day when there will be no more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. And we know it for sure because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so help us to hold on to, to our belief in the resurrection 
when it is opposed by those inside and outside the church. And Lord, we pray that you would give us confidence to preach the resurrected Lord to those around us. And we pray that you would turn their hearts to submit to Jesus as their King and Saviour. So Lord, we thank you for this wonderful news. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.